Good afternoon. I'm Commander Ibad Khan, and I'm representing the Clinician Outreach and Communication Activity, COCA, with the Emergency Risk Communication Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I'd like to welcome you to today's COCA call. HHS and CDC recommendations to expand the use of naloxone, a life-saving yet underutilized drug for reversing opioid overdose. You may participate in today's presentation via webinar, or you may download the slides if you are unable to access the webinar. The PowerPoint slides and the webinar link can be found on our COCA webpage at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Again, the web address is emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Free continuing education is offered for this webinar. Instructions on how to earn continuing education will be provided at the end of the call. In compliance with continuing education requirements, CDC, our planners, our presenters, and their spouses, partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. Planners have reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. Content will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this continuing education activity. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. You may submit questions at any time during the presentation through the Zoom webinar system by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question. Please do not ask a question using the chat button. Questions regarding the webinar should be entered using only the Q&A button. For those who have media questions, please contact CDC Media Relations at 404-639 3286 or send an email to media at cdc.gov. If you're a patient, please refer your questions to your healthcare provider. At the conclusion of the session, participants will be able to accomplish the following. Identify the risk factors for opioid overdose, promote the CDC guideline recommendations and the Department of Health and Human Services guidance on naloxone co-prescribing, describe the history of naloxone use and current state level policies, discuss the steps that can be taken to link survivors of opioid overdose to treatment, and describe actions that can help expand naloxone access at the local level. It is my honor and privilege to welcome our guest speaker, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, the 20th Surgeon General of the United States. During his tenure as Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Adams has created several initiatives to tackle our nation's most pressing health issues, including the opioid epidemic. In response to the opioid epidemic, he issued the first Surgeon General's advisory in 13 years, urging more Americans to carry naloxone. Vice Admiral Adams also released Facing Addiction in America, the Surgeon General's spotlight on opioids and a digital postcard calling for a cultural shift in the way Americans think about, talk about, and respond to the opioid crisis. His Surgeon General's postcard recommends actions that can prevent and treat opioid misuse and promote recovery. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our presenter, Captain Christopher Jones. Captain Jones is the Director of Strategy and Innovation at CDC's Injury Center in the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. He is a nationally recognized subject matter expert in drug overdose epidemiology, policy, and research, and has published more than 50 peer-reviewed articles on the topic. Captain Jones served as a senior author on the recent CDC Vital Signs Journal article life-saving naloxone from pharmacies in August 2019. Captain Jones has a long history of leading policy and research efforts related to opioid overdose within HHS, including at the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I would now like to welcome our special guest, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams. Sir, please begin. Thank you so much for the introduction, Commander Khan. And also thank you, Captain Jones. For those of you on the call who aren't aware, uh, both of them are excellent clinicians and officers in the United States Public Health Service, and they're working to protect and promote our country's health. As the nation's doctor, 
I'm grateful for the CDC's extremely important work to address the opioid epidemic, and I'm grateful to all of you for joining us for this very important conversation. I've encountered the complexities of dealing with addiction not only clinically as an anesthesiologist who still practices, and also professionally as a state health commissioner and then as the United States Surgeon General, but also personally. As some of you may know, my own brother Philip has struggled with addiction for decades. His struggles are shared by individuals and families like mine all across the country. Next slide, please. My family, like many other families across America, has witnessed firsthand the pain that comes from opioid use disorder, which is also commonly referred to as addiction. As I've traveled across the country visiting communities impacted by the opioid epidemic, I've met many individuals who've either lost a loved one to this epidemic or who are struggling with addiction themselves. Meeting families, community members, and those most affected by loss or addiction has helped shape my commitment to make progress on this critical issue. I want us to work together to prevent addiction and to help those who need treatment, our friends, coworkers, and family members get timely treatment that works. It's why my motto as Surgeon General is better health through better partnerships. Because we've seen throughout this opioid epidemic that only by working together can we overcome. At the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, we're committed to addressing the opioid crisis using a whole of society approach. We recognize that the federal government cannot solve this problem alone. Solutions require collaboration at the federal, state, and local levels. That's why we're working with the academic community, law enforcement and first responders, nonprofit organizations, and faith-based organizations, as well as the commercial sector and many others. Now, I want you to know that as your Surgeon General, I'm particularly focused on three key aspects of the opioid crisis, prevention, education, and access to naloxone. First of all, we must prevent addiction before it starts. We're working with healthcare professionals to better integrate mental health assessment and treatment, as well as to improve prescribing practices. We're working to help patients understand the benefits of opioid alternatives, as well as how to safely use, store, and dispose of prescription opioids. The fact is, to successfully combat this epidemic, all of us as clinicians, public health and healthcare professionals, and patients have extremely important roles to play. Second, I'm working to educate the public about the severity of the epidemic and working with our communities to reduce negative attitudes and discrimination towards people with substance use disorder. We need your help to help the public understand substance use disorder is a chronic disease that must be treated with the same skill, the same compassion, and the same urgency that we treat conditions like diabetes or hypertension. And as with other chronic diseases, we have evidence-based treatment that works, and we know that recovery is possible. Unfortunately, far too many in the public don't recognize this reality. We need to do our part to end stigma surrounding addiction, and make no mistake about it, stigma exists among our colleagues as well as amongst the general public. I've seen it in my practice, in my operating room, and in my day-to-day -day life. Help everyone, especially patients and families, but including your colleagues, understand that substance use disorder is a chronic disease that impacts the brain. But also help them understand recovery is possible, as is recurrence, and we need to ensure that we have the supports for people so that we can help them recover from a relapse and continue their recovery journey. Next slide, please. Third, I'm focused on putting the lock zone in the hands of first responders and community members. We must, and let me say this again, we must get in the lock zone into the hands of more first responders and community members so that they can help save lives and then provide a warm handoff to connect individuals to effective treatment. As many of you know, last year I released an advisory urging more Americans to get and know how to use naloxone. As a matter of fact, We'll be tweeting out my advisory now in the hopes that you'll share it. Since that advisory, more than 2.7 million two-dose units of naloxone have been distributed to states and local communities. 
We need you to continue to be part of the solution by carrying naloxone. Anyone can save a life if they have naloxone on hand and know how to use it. Some of you on this phone call have been in rooms where I've asked folks to raise their hand if they carry naloxone, and I'm often disappointed at how few clinicians, how few health professionals actually are walking the talk by carrying naloxone themselves. But I also point out to these same crowds that you're much more likely in many communities to encounter someone having an opioid overdose than you are to encounter someone who has CPR. Until we make the carrying of naloxone as ubiquitous as the knowledge of CPR, we won't achieve maximal results. Far too often, I hear unfortunate stories about someone overdosing and dying despite bystanders being there to witness it. And it's because they don't have access to or know how to use naloxone, or they're worried about the ramifications to themselves if they intervene. You can help us tremendously by helping people become better educated about what the laws are in their states and what the availability looks like in their communities. We need your help. I need you to help me in preventing overdose death. Together, we can educate the community about the warning signs of opioid overdose, raise awareness of the availability of naloxone, both injector and nasal, by standing order or prescription. In your own practice, I'm calling on you to offer to co-prescribe naloxone to those taking opioids to manage chronic pain and to those who may be at risk or who know someone at risk for an opioid overdose. Make sure you're familiar with the standing order laws and legal protections for physician prescribers and bystanders, otherwise known as Good Samaritans, who administer naloxone when encountering an overdose situation in your state. Now, before I turn this over to Captain Jones for an in-depth presentation about the department's recommendations for the prescribing and dispensing of naloxone, I wanna thank you again for joining today's call. Please, please don't let this conversation be yet another one where we're simply preaching to the choir. I urge you to use your voices to go out into the communities where you live, learn, work, and play, and speak with your colleagues, with your friends, and with your fellow community com members about the state steps we can all take to prevent this unfortunate epidemic and to help overcome it. And let me leave you with one last challenge. I ask all of you, what would it take for your team, your workplace, your church, your synagogue or mosque, your Kiwanis or Elks Club to drop the gauntlet on the lock zone? I'm asking you to challenge your peeps to equip themselves with naloxone and acquaint themselves with how to administer it. And if this intrigues you, I ask that you really step up to the challenge and do this within the next 90 days. By December 17th, you will have accomplished something mighty for the public's health. You'll be saving lives and making second chances count all across the country. I'll now turn it over to Captain Jones to continue our conversation. Uh, thank you, Surgeon, <clears throat> Surgeon General Adams, and uh, thank you so much for your unwavering support on this issue, uh, as well as your support of uh, Commission Corps officers such as myself. Uh, so today, I want to provide a short update on the epidemiology of the opioid overdose epidemic. I'll talk about the role of naloxone, um, recent guidance from both CDC and the Department of Health and Human Services, around naloxone co-prescribing and prescribing, and then really focus in on our recent August 2019 CDC vital signs on pharmacy-based naloxone dispensing, and then I'll end with some recommendations for action. Next slide, please. And next slide. Uh, this is probably a slide that is familiar to many of you, but we have continued to see uh, devastating impacts of the opioid overdose epidemic in communities across the U.S. And for many years, uh, in the, really the first wave of the epidemic was where prescription opioids were the primary driver of overdose deaths. Uh, starting in about 2010, heroin-related overdose deaths uh, began to rise in the U.S. And then more recently, since about 2013, the third wave of synthetic opioid, uh, primarily illicitly made fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, have been driving the increase. And you can really see from this uh, figure, the dramatic increase in overdose deaths that we've seen in the last couple of years due to synthetic opioids. Next slide. And we continue to see the overdose crisis evolve in the US. More recently, there's been a focus on rising numbers of overdose deaths that involve stimulants, primarily cocaine, 
uh, and psychostimulants, which are largely methamphetamine related overdose deaths. And this figure simply tries to dis depict the role that opioids play in these overdose deaths. And you can see in 2017, about a little more than 70% of cocaine related overdose deaths also involved an opioid. About 50% of those deaths were synthetic opioid involved. Uh, when we look at the category of drugs that are classified as psychostimulants, again, a largely methamphetamine uh, related overdose deaths, we see that about 50% of the overdose deaths in 2017 also involved opioids, and about 25% of those deaths uh, were where synthetic opioids uh, were involved. And so I think when we, we think about who might need naloxone, we really have seen as the illicit drug supply has um, proliferated with synthetic opioids, we see mixing of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs with cocaine and psychostimulants, we really need to think about broadening beyond people who are knowingly using opioids, but people who might be exposed to opioids through use of other illicit drugs. Next slide. And you saw from the Surgeon General slide uh, some uh, potentially positive news uh, around at least stabilization, if not small declines in drug overdose deaths in the US based on uh, provisional data for 2018. This just looks at the change um, from at the state level from uh, December 2017 through December 2018 for provisional data. Again, we see that uh, we are predicting that a, about half of the states, slightly more than half of the states will see a decline in their overdose deaths, but about uh, a little bit less than a half are still seeing increases and those are in the orange states. So certainly we have uh, much more to do to continue to make progress on addressing the overdose epidemic. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And within the overall HHS 5-point opioid strategy, naloxone is a key pillar. Um, and you can see here, better targeting of overdose reversing drugs is a key component of that. And we have uh, released resources from a variety of different HHS agencies, including CDC, uh, that are helping to uh, get naloxone into the hands of people in communities who can respond to overdose. Next slide. And the concept of using naloxone to reverse an overdose is certainly not new. Healthcare providers and emergency departments and other medical settings, uh, as well as emergency medical services providers have used naloxone for many years to reverse overdose or to uh, reverse sedation after surgery when somebody has received opioids. But the idea of putting naloxone into the hands of people in the community is, is, is more new. Uh, starting in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we started to see community-based programs, uh, often syringe services programs or harm reduction programs, um, equipping individuals who use drugs or those who are in the network of people who use drugs with naloxone and training them on overdose recognition and response uh, with naloxone. And then we have seen in the last five or six years increasing use of, of naloxone among police and other first responders, non-EMS personnel, uh, because they are often the first people on the scene. And so there's certainly an opportunity to leverage those responders to save a life. Um, and in really in the last five years, uh, <clears throat> we have seen a dramatic increase in pharmacy-based uh, naloxone laws across states. Essentially all states have some type of standing order law or collaborative practice agreement or pharmacist dispensing law that allows a pharmacist to dispense naloxone to an individual without a patient specific prescription. Um, and they take slightly different forms across the states, but it has really been an area, if you've been working in drug policy for any period of time, where we have seen this rapid adoption of state laws across states moving much faster than many other types of laws. So it's very encouraging that uh, people have moved beyond um, you know, concerns around naloxone, which is increased risky behavior, uh, but to recognize really the important role of naloxone in reversing overdose. Next slide. And it was really through that lens of a changing uh, legal and policy landscape at the state level um, that CDC in their 2016 guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain included recommendations for naloxone co-prescribing to patients who are receiving opioids, recognizing that it is an important risk mitigation uh, strategy for individuals who are receiving opioids. And in the CDC guideline, uh, the guideline recommends considering that providers consider offering naloxone to patients who are receiving opioid therapy when risk factors that increase the risk for overdose, opioid overdose exist. And specifically, they call out uh, patients with a history of overdose. We know that that is a 
uh, significant predictor for a future overdose. Uh, patients with a history of substance use disorder, patients who are receiving high doses of opioids in, in the CDC guideline that was defined as receiving 50 morphine milligram equivalents uh, per day or more, as well as patients who are receiving opioids concurrently with benzodiazepines. And we see in the mortality data, uh, as well as in, in the morbidity data, emergency department data, that benzodiazepines are often uh, co-occurrent with opioids in overdose deaths or non-fatal overdoses. And so that is certainly a population of individuals uh, who are at risk. Again, the CDC guideline was really focusing on patients who are receiving opioids uh, for chronic pain and really aimed at primary care clinicians uh, who are prescribing opioids outside of active cancer treatment, palliative care, and end-of-life care. And it was one of the recommendations included in the guideline. Uh, next slide. And last fall, uh, recognizing again the unpredictability of the illicit drugs drug supply and the expanded need for naloxone among people who are, are knowingly and not knowingly using opioids, uh, HHS issued guidance on naloxone co-prescribing and naloxone prescribing uh, really to have sort of a one voice from HHS about you know, what are different agencies saying. Uh, and so we pulled a group together within the department um, to come up with these recommendations that can speak or the whole department. And we divided this into two separate groups. So the first group, um, again, consistent with the CDC guideline was around patients who are being prescribed opioids uh, for pain care. Uh, so consider offering naloxone for patients, again, receiving high doses of opioids, uh, again, defined as greater than 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day. Um, and then regardless of the opioid dose, there were a number of uh, disease states or other risk factors um, where we believed it was important for clinicians to consider prescribing uh, naloxone. <clears throat> the first was for patients who had respiratory conditions such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or obstructive sleep apnea uh, as they are, have an increased risk for overdose. Uh, patients who have been prescribed benzodiazepines concomitantly with opioids patients who have a non-opioid substance use disorder, those that report excessive alcohol use, and those who have a mental health disorder. Uh, again, sort of broadening beyond what was included in the CDC guideline, but again, recognizing that these are important risk factors for overdose that clinicians uh, should be aware of and consider offering naloxone. Uh, we also included recommendations, not for co-prescribing, because these are individuals who are not necessarily receiving opioids for pain management, but prescribing of naloxone uh, for patients that are at high risk for experiencing or responding to an opioid overdose. And so that includes uh, obviously people who are using illicit opioids, heroin, illicit synthetic opioids, or misusing prescription opioids. Uh, individuals who are using other illicit drugs like methamphetamine or cocaine, which could potentially be mixed with illicit synthetic opioids like fentanyl, where the individual may have uh, quite low tolerance because they're not regularly using opioids, but may be exposed to a very high potent opioid, uh, such as fentanyl unknowingly. Uh, for patients who are receiving treatment for opioid use disorder, we know that those individuals are certainly <clears throat> at high risk uh, for experiencing an overdose. And that includes individuals who are, are on the abstinence-based track, as well as those who are receiving a medication-assisted treatment uh, with methadone, buprenorphine, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. Again, just as a risk mitigation strategy for individuals uh, to reverse an overdose. And then with individuals who have a history of opioid misuse that were recently released from incarceration or some other controlled setting where their uh, physical tolerance to opioids has been lost. Again, we know especially people who are being released uh, from the criminal justice system uh, are at extremely high risk for overdose. And so equipping this population with naloxone is certainly an important step in reducing risk for that population. Next slide. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'll now talk about the CDC vital signs uh, from August that really focused in on pharmacy-based uh, naloxone distribution. And one of the reasons that we were interested in looking at this is that there have been a number of uh, different surveys that have been done looking at community-based naloxone distribution. Um, and then there are a number of studies that have looked at sort of the association between um, naloxone laws and showing a positive impact on overdose deaths, uh, especially when you have uh, pharmacists sending orders or some sort of pharmacist prescriptive authority. Um, but we really didn't have a good sense of how dispensing of naloxone varied across the U.S., in particular at the county level. Uh, and so we embarked in this vital signs to really give uh, the most current 
assessment of naloxone dispensing from pharmacies. And you can find the full information on the vital signs at the, at the link that is provided on this slide. Uh, next slide. And for the data that were underlying the vital signs, it came from IQBIA data, which essentially captures uh, the vast majority of retail pharmacies in the U.S. Uh, on products that are dispensed. And we looked at um, the naloxone dispensing data from retail pharmacies from 2012 to 2018, but primarily focused on uh, 2018 data. But as you can see here, uh, we have really seen a precipitous increase in naloxone dispensing uh, from U.S. pharmacies over the last uh, decade. About 1,300 prescriptions in 2012, up to a little bit more than 560,000 prescriptions in 2018. And in fact, we actually saw a doubling, uh, more than doubling of prescriptions just between 2017 and 2018 alone. There are about 270,000 prescriptions dispensed in 2017. So as the Surgeon General indicated, there has been a large uh, push publicly, uh, resource-wise, to uh, expand pharmacy-based naloxone dispensing, and we are really seeing that happen uh, in communities across the country. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so beyond just looking at the national level, we also wanted to look at uh, naloxone dispensing and how that varied across urbanization levels as well as U.S. census regions. Uh, from the overall trend, again, we see there's been a significant increase uh, across all levels um, however, micropolitan areas had the highest rate um, per 100,000 population. Chris, if you can hear me, it uh, looks like we're having some technical difficulty with uh, the volume uh, with Chris's presentation. So please stand by. Thank you. Okay, somehow I got dropped there, I apologize. Um, we see that uh, the trend overall for all of the uh, census regions has been increasing, uh, like we see for urbanization levels as well. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at uh, naloxone dispensing in 2018 by sex as well as age group. Um, and uh, we found that females had uh, higher rates um, per 100,000 population of naloxone dispensing from retail pharmacies. And then when we look at age, uh, not surprisingly, we see the highest rates among populations who are uh, you know, 40 to 74 with the highest rate among 60 to 64 year olds. Again, not surprising because those are populations who are also likely to be prescribed opioids um, and have probably been prescribed opioids for a number of years and so are, are likely to have uh, be receiving higher doses of opioids. Um, I, I would note that uh, when we look at the mortality data, the 25 to 34 year olds have uh, the highest rates of opioid related overdose deaths, yet they have uh, pretty uh, significantly smaller rates for naloxone uh, co-prescribing. Um, so certainly there is an opportunity or naloxone dispensing. So certainly there's an opportunity to leverage pharmacy-based dispensing for that risk population as well. Next slide. And one of the issues that has certainly been of tremendous interest is sort of the cost burden to patients uh, for naloxone and is often identified as a barrier for individuals who are interested in receiving naloxone, um, but you know, they have a significant copay or they don't have insurance and, and uh, you know, that can serve as a barrier um, to being able to get naloxone from a pharmacy. And so we looked at um, uh, copay amount uh, in 2018 by different payers. Overall, we found that about 42% of the prescriptions uh, were associated with no copay, uh, and another about 25% were associated with essentially from one penny to ten dollars uh, as a copay. Um, only 5.8% were associated with a copay that was over fifty dollars. So certainly that's encouraging overall. Uh, however, when you look at different um, types of insurance, commercial, private payers, Medicare, Medicaid, and self-pay, 
uh, we see that there are some differences. Uh, in particular, in the Medicare population, 75 uh, percent of the naloxone prescriptions dispensed uh, did require some level of copay. And then certainly on the self-pay side, you see uh, about a third of the prescriptions where the copay was over $50. Uh, so certainly opportunities uh, to look at payment policy coverage and reimbursement policy in order to uh, help encourage uh, further adoption of naloxone dispensing. And I will say our colleagues at CMS actually issued a letter uh, to Medicare Part D providers encouraging them uh, to really take a close look at uh, payments, uh, copayment, uh, and in look at reducing cost sharing for patients in the Medicare population. So uh, we are certainly encouraged by that effort from CMS. Next slide. And so uh, beyond looking at demographics, uh, looking at uh, insurance type, we also looked at um, naloxone dispensing by prescriber specialty. And we looked at this in a couple of different ways. The first um, figure looks at just who accounted for the largest percentage of naloxone prescriptions. And not surprisingly, uh, primary care uh, physicians, pain medicine physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants accounted for the majority of naloxone prescriptions. They're also the most uh, numerous, certainly for primary care nurse practitioners and PAs, the most numerous types of practitioners. Um, when we look at prescribing of uh, or dispensing of naloxone per 100 high-dose opioid prescriptions that are dispensed, we see a bit of a different picture. Um, the sort of usual suspects or the, the specialties that often prescribe uh, opioids, in particular high-dose opioids, uh, actually had quite low rates of naloxone prescribing. So for primary primary care uh, providers, it was 1.5 naloxone prescriptions per 100 high-dose opioid prescriptions. Um, pain medicine, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs were, you know, in a similar range. Um, interestingly, uh, specialties like psychiatry and addiction, which don't prescribe opioids that often, had much higher rates. It's not surprising because they're seeing a population at high risk for other reasons beyond receiving high doses of opioids. Uh, so certainly encouraging that they are, they are also prescribing naloxone to that patient population. Um, but overall, we found that there was one naloxone prescription for every 69 high-dose opioid prescriptions in 2018. So again, CDC guideline recommendations, HHS guidance uh, indicate that uh, providers should consider uh, co-prescribing naloxone when patients are receiving high doses of opioids. Uh, we are seeing that there's certainly room for uh, growth in naloxone dispensing among that patient population. Next slide. We also were able to look at, uh, so the data I've presented so far are essentially looking at um, numbers of prescriptions dispensed and you know rates uh, of that per population or per, per high-dose opioid prescribing. We also looked at essentially unique patients um, receiving high doses of opioids and there were about 9 million uh, patients in 2018 who received high doses, uh, high dose opioid prescription, uh, only 406,000 of these individuals received a, a prescription for naloxone. So just another way of looking at sort of the gap between <clears throat> who uh, is considered to be at risk and, and a possible candidate uh, for receiving naloxone compared to uh, you know what proportion of patients in that population are actually receiving naloxone. Again, opportunities uh, for clinicians who are prescribing high doses of opioids uh, to have that conversation about opioid safety and the role of naloxone and consider co-prescribing naloxone. Next slide. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, we were very interested in looking at the county level uh, variation in naloxone prescriptions dispensed. Um, we have seen from previous research that there's a, a significant uh, variation across counties in opioid prescribing, in um, access to uh, buprenorphine waiver prescribers, uh, but we did not have uh, estimates for county level naloxone prescription suspense. And this slide just looks at the county rates per 100,000 persons in that population. Uh, you can see that the black colored counties have the highest uh, rates, um, and then it goes down from there with lighter colors having uh, lower rates. And overall, there was a 25-fold variation uh, between the lowest um, prescribed dispensing quartile and the highest uh, dispensing quartile. 
And you can see it tends to cluster in certain areas. Uh, this is not necessarily surprising if you've looked at county level drug overdose death rates, uh, you tend to see like in the Appalachian area, um, clustering for overdose death rates. You see similar things here for naloxone. But again, um, there is a pretty substantial variation uh, across counties in the US. Next slide. Uh, we also looked at um, rates of prescribing or dispensing of naloxone per 100 high dose opioid prescriptions dispensed. Again, it looks fairly similar um, to the population based uh, rates of naloxone dispensing. Uh, but you can see here, again, wide variation across counties. One of the uh, particularly interesting, if not uh, somewhat concerning statistics from the vital signs was that one in 12 counties dispensed high doses of opioids, but not naloxone in 2018. Again, I think it really just underscores the opportunity to leverage the health system and healthcare providers, in particular providers who are prescribing opioids, uh, as an avenue to get naloxone to individuals who are at risk. Next slide. Uh, and of course, uh, no CDC uh, publication um, would be doing justice if we didn't have a multivariable model. Uh, and so we looked at the various characteristics of counties uh, that were associated with high naloxone dispensing counties as well as low naloxone dispensing counties. Um, a couple of uh, particular findings that are, I think, salient for the conversation. Um, as expected, we found uh, that Counties that have higher um, high dose opioid dispensing rates have higher drug overdose death rates and have higher potential buprenorphine treatment capacity, meaning they have more waivered providers, um, were all positively associated with being a high naloxone dispensing county. So those are good things. We would expect that communities are responding to the problems that they are seeing. Uh, so those that have higher overdose death rates are engaging in the practice of naloxone. Uh, we also found that the percent uh, of the county that's covered by Medicaid was also positively associated with being in a, a high naloxone dispensing county. Um, when we look at urbanization level, we see that both micropolitan counties as well as rural counties, and I would say rural counties in particular, um, are, are less likely, have lower odds of being a high naloxone dispensing county compared to metropolitan counties. Uh, so certainly rural areas face many challenges in addressing the opioid crisis. Uh, and they appear to have um, lower access uh, and lower dispensing of naloxone. Um, when we look at sort of the flip side of this and the lower uh, quartile, the bottom quartile of naloxone dispensing counties, again, not surprisingly, we see sort of the opposite. High dose opioid prescribing, drug overdose death rate, and potential buprenorphine treatment capacity are all negatively associated with being in uh, the bottom quartile. Um, however, uh, when we look at uh, poverty, uh, we see that the percent of population uh, with income below the federal poverty level is positively associated uh, with being a low naloxone dispensing county. And again, rural counties really stick out here, uh, having a pretty significant uh, 2.61 odds ratio for being in a low naloxone dispensing county. So again, um, I think this helps provide some insight into the particular characteristics of counties that are on either end uh, of the range and certainly help to understand what's going on in some of the maps and why there might be some variation and certainly opportunities for prevention. Next slide. So uh, with all of our vital science products, we always include recommendations for action. So we looked at all this data, we found these things, what should people do with the information that they now have? Uh, so from a pharmacist and other healthcare provider perspective, um, certainly monitoring patients for risk of overdose, um, prescribing or dispensing naloxone when overdose risk factors are present, and counseling patients on how to use it are key steps uh, that healthcare providers and pharmacists can take. Uh, from a pharmacy perspective, ensuring that naloxone is always available in pharmacies. Um, and then even if it is available, ensuring that people are engaging uh, in offering and educating individuals about naloxone. We certainly hear of many stories where pharmacies don't have it or pharmacies are, are hesitant 
uh, to give it out or they only give it out to certain patients. And I think this is a real opportunity to recognize the role that pharmacists and other healthcare providers can play uh, in conjunction with the other community-based naloxone programs, first responders, EMS, and others. Uh, but there's a real opportunity here, and I think our data really underscore that, um, that there are some people people in some communities that are clearly embracing this approach and others that have uh, not gotten on board fully. Uh, and so there's certainly opportunities there. Uh, from a health insurer's uh, perspective, again, we saw that there was variation across uh, insurance uh, payer type. So thinking about reducing patient out-of-pocket costs, how do we incentivize people to uh, get naloxone if they're at risk or their family members are at risk and thinking about you know, what level would someone have to pay in order to do it and, and trying to reduce the burden uh, on individuals and then ensuring that um, the Loxone prescriptions are covered without prior approval. We clearly have embraced the idea that naloxone is a key uh, overdose risk mitigation approach. Uh, so reducing arbitrary barriers, um, both the CDC guideline and HHS guidance sort of spell out um, sort of pretty broad categories of individuals who are at risk and who are uh, possible candidates for naloxone. We wanna make sure that there are not arbitrary barriers to those individuals actually uh, receiving the product. Next slide. And then of course, states and communities uh, can work with healthcare providers to expand naloxone access. And I think again, our data underscore that this is particularly important in rural areas who face many structural uh, and health system challenges, um, but Rural areas have pharmacies, and pharmacies can, again, be a place where naloxone can be dispensed to individuals who are at risk. Um, promoting the benefits of prescribing, dispensing, and carrying naloxone. I think uh, there are certainly an opportunity to continue to combat stigma around uh, opioid use disorder, around overdose, around using naloxone and other harm reduction approaches, and states and community leaders are a key part of changing those social norms. And then supporting harm reduction programs uh, improving access to medication assisted treatment for opioid use disorder are key components that need to be taken in conjunction with expansion of pharmacy-based naloxone. Uh, again, this is uh, again an important area in rural areas of the country um, where syringe services programs, other harm reduction programs have, uh, I think only more recently begun to be implemented. Um, and so there's an opportunity to do this in conjunction with efforts to expand pharmacy-based uh, naloxone dispensing. And then of course, naloxone really provides an opportunity to save a life, uh, to connect individuals into treatment, to reduce harms from drug use. And of course, medication treatment for opioid use disorder is a key component of changing that trajectory for someone uh, who has been using opioids or has an opioid use disorder. Next slide. And um, before we go to questions and answers, I wanna thank you again for participating today. Thank you to Surgeon Cheryl Adams. Uh, for his leadership on this issue and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Vice Admiral Adams and Captain Jones for providing our audience with such a wealth of information on this important public health topic. We appreciate your time and value your clinical insights on this matter. We will now go into our Q&A session. Please remember you may submit questions through the webinar system by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and then typing your question. Again, please do not ask a question using the chat button. We have a couple of questions that have come to our webinar system. First question refers to uh, Captain Jones' presentation uh, as far as indications related to um, increased risk for opioid um, substance abuse. Can you please elaborate or give examples of non-opioid substance disorders being an indication for um, increased risk? Sure, and that is really focused on people who are, are receiving opioids for pain therapy. There are a number of epidemiological studies that have found that individuals who have alcohol use disorder, who have cocaine use disorder, other drug dependence or drug use disorders are at an increased risk of an overdose, an opioid overdose even after accounting for things like um, other mental health conditions or even morphine milligram equivalent dose. And so uh, I think there's sufficient epidemiological data to suggest that that is a risk group um, that it's not solely dependent on the morphine milligram equivalent dose, but that opioids plus that other risk factor um, 
at any dose uh, increase the risk for opioid-related overdose. Thank you, Captain Jones. Our next question asks um, um, about the, um, if you're aware of any one, as they pose the question, any one co-packaging naloxone with AEDs. Uh, I think that there have certainly been conversations around that, but off the top of my head, I'm not aware of particular community or jurisdiction uh, that is doing that, that I can name it, but it's certainly that has been a conversation that has been circling. Um, and we certainly can get back to you. We can look into that and get back. Thank you. Um, our next inquirer is interested in uh, knowing if there is a way for them to access state level data related to uh, uh, pharmacies uh, dispensing naloxone. They're aware that that takes place, but would like to see data to see uh, about, the, about what extent that takes place. So they're interested in accessing state level data related to pharmacy dispensing of naloxone. Um, well, we used the IQVIA data and looked at the county level. Certainly those data are available at the state level. Um, CDC does publish uh, various data on rates of opioid prescribing and other factors. I'd have to check and see if uh, we have plans for publishing state rates of naloxone dispensing. Um, but certainly if there's a particular state, uh, you could submit that request and we could see if that fits within our contractual agreements with IQVIA to make that data available. Um, but certainly others are, are free to uh, engage with Acubia and others who have these data uh, to look at dispensing patterns at their, in their particular state. Thank you, Captain Jones. And as a reminder to all our audience, if you have questions such as this, please send them to coca at cdc.gov after this call and we can get that to the presenters so they can uh, perhaps get back to you with some of these questions that take a little bit more time. Uh, another question related to um, naloxone and uh, local pharmacies is, are you aware of what preparations are available at these pharmacies? Is it just the injectable or intranasal or both? Uh, I'm not aware of anything systematic that's evaluated what each individual pharmacy covers or you know keeps in stock, but I, I think certainly the FDA products that have an approval for uh, non-medical personal use, so the auto injector, the Narcan nasal spray, uh, would typically be things that are covered. Uh, the older formulations are also uh, stocked, so the injectable formulations are also stocked in many pharmacies. Another inquirer is interested in knowing if you have any recommendations or have any um, cases that you can refer people to of how to implement naloxone programs at the workplace, if you're aware of any um, um, areas that have tried that and how successful they have been? Hmm. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but the National Safety Council does uh, quite a lot around workplace uh, businesses and opioid uh, overdose prevention. So they might be uh, a group to reach out to. Um, and then their folks, um, that have been part of the prescribed to prevent, uh, like Tracy Green and Jeff Bradberg, who uh, have largely focused in on pharmacy-based naloxone, but they also may be a good resource to think about what people might do within the business sector. Thank you. Another question uh, related to naloxone is asking if there's any uh, uh, studies that have been done about efficacy uh, of naloxone after the expiration date. I'm guessing they're asking in case they have it and it's uh, out of date, if, it, if there's any shelf life extension type studies that you're aware of. Uh, I would probably refer them to FDA. I'm not aware of, I, I can't think of a paper right off the top of my head that's looked at that in a systematic way. Thank you for that. Um, another question we have is, uh, are there any, um, um, uh, potential uh, opportunities for introducing naloxone programs or distribution within the criminal justice system, as if um, uh, the inquirer seems to uh, be asking if there is an uh, increased risk there that can also be addressed by uh, a naloxone distribution. Yes, so there are definitely um, state and local criminal justice systems uh, that are equipping people 
with naloxone up on discharge. Um, they've been doing that for a number of years. Uh, I think Rhode Island's criminal justice system is, is an example of their prison system. Uh, in addition to looking at medication treatment for opioid use disorder in prison, they also offer naloxone uh, prior to discharge. So there are a number of communities that are doing that. And it's certainly, I always think of it as sort of a low hanging fruit population. We have very good and consistent data that individuals who are being released from incarceration are at extraordinarily high risk for overdose in the first couple of weeks. Uh, after being released. Um, and so providing naloxone in addition to things like medication uh, treatment for opioid use disorder are really critical uh, steps that uh, the criminal justice system can take. Thank you. Um, another question is, are you aware of any um, 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 federal HHS, CDC, et cetera, resources that local governments uh, can bring to bear uh, uh, when uh, trying to overcome prejudices or misinformation when it comes to um, utilizing some of these harm reduction practices? Uh, well, so CDC has an RX awareness campaign that has been out uh, for the last couple of years, which really focuses on the risk around uh, opioids and overdose. Um, but I think part of that campaign is really trying to think about raising the conversation around people who are at risk or who have survived an overdose of recovery. Uh, SAMHSA has other resources as well um, that uh, target um, public education, training, those types of things. So uh, you can find both of those on both the CDC and the SAMHSA website. Uh, one more thing that I would mention is uh, a year ago during recovery month, the Office of the Surgeon General put out our spotlight on opioids and the harm reduction is talked about in that spotlight on opioids among uh, many other topics uh, related to uh, stigma, related to best practices. It's about a 20 to 25 page read. You can get through it in about 30 to 45 minutes. It was really designed for clinicians, policymakers, other folks who want to take a deeper dive into the, uh, the science, the evidence, um, the, the facts behind uh, the opioid epidemic. It really designed as a quick primer. So I would encourage you to go to surgeongeneral.gov and look up that spotlight on opioids. And then that also allows you to take that around with you and say, the Surgeon General says X, Y, and Z. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Can you also address, please, the uh, likelihood or expectation of naloxone to be perhaps over the counter in the uh, near future? Well, certainly this is an area where FDA has been uh, very open and interested in engaging with industry. Uh, certainly folks at FDA can give you more detail, but they have uh, uh, convened a number of meetings, which I've participated in over the last couple of years to think about um, the requirements around OTC naloxone, they've done some testing for uh, the drug facts label and, and sort of can people comprehend and use these products uh, outside of the um, sort of pharmacy-based dispensing system. Um, and I know that they're very open to engaging with uh, industry who are interested in bringing a product uh, to the market OTC. Thank you. Um, next question is uh, regarding a uh, specific practice side and, and the question states, in a managed care setting where comprehensive medication, medication reviews and medication reconciliation reviews are the primary focus, would it be best, best practice to inform the patient about naloxone and have them talk to their provider or contact the provider directly about prescribing naloxone if the patient meets the criteria? I think it could probably go both ways. I mean, as uh, I'm assuming this is question probably coming from a pharmacist or a nurse, um, but you know, if you're doing medication reviews, uh, it often depends. I mean, in some cases it makes more sense to engage with the patient, and in some cases you want to make that recommendation to the clinician. In some cases you may want to do both. Um, so I think it sort of, it depends on your relationship with the clinician, your relationship with the patient, and sort of the, the context in which um, those relationships are being leveraged in, you know, for other chronic disease management, other medication management. But I think, you know, we have good science to indicate the patients who are at risk. Um, there's very little downside uh, to naloxone as far as adverse events go. 
Um, so it seems like a logical place where if you're doing that, you flag something as you would with any other condition. If you see a, you know, a significant drug-drug interaction, you're going to flag that. In some cases, you may want to talk to the provider or the patient or both. Uh, I think you just take the same approach as you would with naloxone. It's, it's a risk mitigation approach uh, for patients who are at risk for opioid overdose. Thank you very much. And for our last question, I'm, I'm going to sort of lump together a, a theme that I'm seeing in a lot of questions from our inquirers, and that is, um, can you discuss strategies that either the agency is uh, pursuing right now, uh, whether it's CDC or other HHS agencies, or some that you uh, are aware of that um, uh, prescribers and other clinicians can take on themselves regarding the role of both national and local specialty organizations uh, and professional associations and or state licensing boards in order to make this uh, uh, more fruitful and successful? What are some things that either are already taking place that you can bring to light for our attendees or ideas you have that they may take home and implement with their organizations and boards of uh, medicine and pharmacy? I'd certainly be interested in hearing from the Surgeon General on this, but one thing I'll say from a policy standpoint is that we have now seen a number of states who have uh, put in place uh, regulations that require naloxone co-prescribing uh, under certain conditions, like high doses of uh, opioids being prescribed or opioids plus benzodiazepines. Uh, I would say that we're still in the early phases of understanding the impacts of those regulations, but in conjunction with the August Vital Signs, we had a, a research letter in JAMA that looked at naloxone co-prescribing in Medicare, in the Medicare Part D program uh, in 2016 and 2017. And the two states that had implemented laws during that time frame were Virginia and Vermont. And what we saw is that those two states were clearly outliers in uh, naloxone dispensing within seven days of receipt of an opioid prescription uh, compared to other states during that time frame. So, uh, that would suggest that the regulations are having an impact on changing practice behavior. Um, but certainly outside of regulations, um, you know, different statements from professional societies, training, getting people comfortable, improving self-efficacy among clinicians uh, around when to co-prescribe, how to have the conversation with the patient. Um, you know, I think those are all areas that uh, professional societies and state medical boards and other licensure boards could all engage in. And I'll jump in on that, too. I'll say that uh, our approach uh, at the federal level is something that we hope folks will adopt on the state level and on the local level. Number one, um, surveillance. So making sure you understand what the burden is in your community and whether you're a positive outlier um, or, a, uh, or a negative outlier in terms of uh, overdoses, in terms of uh, substance misuse in terms of MAT availability, in terms of your prescriptions and naloxone. So that's what the MMWR that came out was really all about. It's about giving you the opportunity to look at your data and find out whether or not you're an outlier. Number two, it's about what this phone call today is doing, is having a conversation. So once you get that data, once you've um, done that surveillance, going back to your local communities, whether your community means your hospital or your uh, specialty group, um, your, your organization or, or, or what have you and having a conversation about it and saying what can we all do about this. I've traveled across the country as Surgeon General and Secretary Azar, um, our Assistant Secretary for Health Admiral Jawa, our CDC Director uh, Dr. Redfield have traveled around the country and try to broker these local conversations and we try to bring that data to you. I've done grand rounds all across the country and uh, I'll leave you with wh what I finished my remarks on earlier, then it's challenging ourselves to do better. And so when I finish grand rounds, I always ask uh, folks to really go out and, uh, and, and walk into a pharmacy, ask for naloxone yourself, find out um, whether or not it's available. And if it isn't, ask why or why not. Find out which forms are available. Find out whether or not you can get it with a copay or without a copay. But really, uh, it's at a grassroots level that uh, we need to empower folks and uh, really challenge folks to, uh, to keep taking these steps forward. And I'm really proud of the fact that because of the efforts of many of you all on this phone, we've substantially increased naloxone prescriptions 
um, across the country. So we're doing uh, some of this work in, in places, uh, but uh, we also need to remember that we've got quite a long way to go and that we need folks to learn from and share best practices and not just rest on our laurels. So uh, again, I want to thank you all, all for giving me the opportunity to address you today and uh, again want to thank you for the work that you've done and challenge each and every one of you to look at your data, broker a conversation, and challenge yourselves to, uh, to do more on a local level so that we can turn this around uh, more quickly. Thank you, sir. On behalf of COCA, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today with a special thank you to our guest speaker, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams and our presenter, Captain Christopher Jones. The recording of this call will be posted within the next few days to the COCA website and available on demand at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. Again, that web address is emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA. All continuing education for COCA calls are issued online through TCE Online, the CDC Training and Continuing Education Online System at www cdc.gov forward slash TCE online. Those who participated in today's COCA call and would like to receive continuing education should complete the online evaluation by October 21, 2019 and use course code WC2922. Those who will review the call on demand and would like to review receive continuing education should complete the online evaluation between October 21, 2019 and October 22, 2021 and use course code WD2922. Please join us for our next COCA call in two days, this Thursday, September 19 at 2 p.m. Eastern time, where the topic will be an update on severe lung illness associated with using e-cigarette products. To receive information on upcoming COCA calls or other COCA products and services, Join the COCA mailing list by visiting the COCA webpage at emergency.cdc.gov forward slash COCA and click on the join the COCA mailing list link. To stay connected to the latest news from COCA, be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash CDC clinician outreach and communication activity. Again, thank you all for joining us for today's call. Have a great day.